as well as the position of director of the Sarkoid Center of Excellence. Uh, Dr. Drake received her medical degree at Vanderbilt University and then received her in center medicine training at the John Hopkins University, then went back to Vanderbilt where she did her, in, her infectious disease fellowship. Since then, she remained on staff at Vanderbilt where she focused her career on investigating the infectious agents in fibrotic lung disease with an emphasis on adaptive immune dysfunction during disease progression as well as the effects of clinical outcomes. Dr. Drake also served as the co-director of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for Funds to retain clinical sciences, which allows her and Vanderbilt to tangibly assist clinical uh, scientists in their career development. She remains committed to investigating the microbial and immunological mechanism that drive pulmonary disease progression. She is the author of hundreds of articles in high impact journals and is a prominent speaker nationally and internationally. Please give me a warm welcome to Dr. Wanda Drake as she gives her excellent presentation in TA17. Cells of pulmonary fibrosis for the foe. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm really honored, very honored to be here. Um, I have a passion for mentoring all young people, but especially the last thing, if you know myself, the challenges that women face. And so I'm going to talk about 17 cells of my men should have. Um, um, so let's start off uh, with a couple of things. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, first thank um, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Pauline Bleacher for endowing this lectureship. And then I'm just going to go walk while I talk. And I'm just going to talk about, you know, Starkwood is super fascinating to me in that if you have 100 people with a disease, 60 are going to resolve the disease on their own with no medical intervention. And then you've got this 20% that just kind of sputter, either the disease or tear outside the lung, like in their skin, or in their brain, in their CNS, or in their kidney. And then you've got this 20% that are going to die from their disease. And it's kind of interesting that early in my career, I was able to show that everybody starts off at home plate. But why do you have these striking disparities in outcomes? And then we're going to talk about um, what we've learned, like right now, our goal for treating patients with psychosis is just to suppress the immune system. But one of the things that I hope you'll learn from today is that the immune system is our friend, and it's actually not to be quelled. And then we're going to discuss this role of PD1, PD, um, PD1 positive PD17 cells, and I'll explain to you as you are going to know just what PD1 is. And then probably the most exciting thing is what have we learned from this, and do we have some potential new therapies? So um, this is the gratuitous lung biopsy of a patient with sarcoidosis. So you can see um, normal list lung tissue. You can see terminal alveoli that you see in pathology. And then you see tons of uh, non-satiating granuloma, which, uh, as you know, is infectious etiologies and chronic lung disease are ruled out when you give them the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And what's really interesting is that most patients with sarcoidosis present with early stage disease. So they present with bilateral hyaluronopathy with a clear lung parenchyma. It makes it worse to actually develop type um, interstitial markings or develop lung um, disease. And then the highlight not to be with shrink, but they continue to have lung involvement. And then they'll develop frank fibrosis. If you present early, the majority of people who resolve the disease present early with stage 0 or stage 1 disease. <coughs> and those who go on to develop fibrosis and take one to two decades to fail down. And so one of the things that's really motivated me is the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is actually increasing. And so this is a graphic depiction from 2011, and there are more recent um, depictions of sarcoidosis, morbidity, and mortality, but this is the most thorough thing that I could find. And so when you look at the number of deaths as well as mortality rates per million, what you see is that for males and for females, um, sarcoidosis death rate is increasing, and they're dying actually from complications of sarcoidosis themselves, mainly pulmonary disease, but some with And then uh, it's never wrong to quote the New England Journal, even if it's 26 years old. And so this is a really similar paper. So Ron Crystal, when he was at the NIH, actually investigated the lung fluid, the BAL of patients with sarcoidosis. And he really just asked, what's the difference between patients with sarcoidosis and then grad students that will let me go on and so this is the normal. And so he looked at sarcoid patients who were symptomatic. And what he noticed is there were kind of immune cells that were producing interleukin 2. He looked at sarcoid patients who weren't having a lot of symptoms, and they had a small amount. These cells were present, definitely higher than normal, but nothing compared to people with active disease. 
And then you look at patients with IPS. And so Ron was the first to report that when you look at them, and the cells that are present in the lavage fluid of patients with sarcoidosis, there's a lot of T cells, and they produce an energy feature. And then he went on to show that if you give steroids, um, ex vivo, to so you take the cells and expose them to steroids, you know, leukin 2 production goes down, as well as the number of CD4 and CD8 T cells. And so what he basically showed is that if you want your, your immune cells to look like a healthy person, which makes sense, you're trying to get them back to normal, which you give them steroids. And so this is really the basis for giving patients. Now we have a much more impressive on the to suppress the immune system, but it really was Ron Fistel's work in the 80s that got us to giving steroids to patients with sarcoidosis. And so, um, this is generally the thinking, the consensus thinking of what happens with sarcoid. So, <coughs> you get um, antigen presenting cells that are recruited from the periphery to terminal alveoli. They mature into professional antigen presenting cells, and then they present antigen in the context of MHC class 2. This antigen is recognized by a T cell, so you've got an antigen presenting cell, you've got proteins you get from your mom and dad. And then you got T cells. And this is called a thi molecular complex. And that, when you can't clear antigen, goes on to form granulomas. And that's the basis for granulomas and tuberculosis, the basis for histoplasmosis, pastidiomycosis. There's nothing new about this song. When you have antigen that you can't clear, and a T cell recognizes it. So we see antigen all the time. The reason staph doesn't cause granulomas is because the immune response is different. You either clear staph or you form an abscess. And with TB, with sarcoidosis and TB and histoplasmosis, you form this, what I call an immunologic jail. So you've got guards, you've got security cameras, you know, this, the granuloma is really an immunologic jail. It's a way of saying, I saw something, I couldn't clear it, but I'm going to put it in jail. And so just like security guards do shift, two cells come and go, just like sometimes security camera works, sometimes it doesn't, same thing happens in a granuloma. It's not... Status. It's actually dynamic. Whatever's driving granuloma formation is changing, and also the immune system is changing. So it's really interesting. The highest incidence of sarcoidosis is actually in Scandinavia. That's the highest worldwide incidence. And then the second is in Japan, the third is the United States, particularly the southeastern United States. Now, in Scandinavia, when they present with sarcoid, <coughs> they present with very acute symptoms, the overwhelming majority of them. So they can honestly say, I was watching the Super Bowl, I saw Russell Wilson throw that interception, and then I started coughing. You know, that's how Scandinavia. So they present very acutely, unlike in the United States, where they present where, you know, I've been short of breath for six months, I had a car accident, I got an x ray, they told me I had cancer, and then they kept doing all these tests and finally diagnosed me with sarcoidosis, and they told me they don't know what's happening. You know, and that's what happens in the United States. Well, in Scandinavia, it's really interesting. If you have this, um, it makes me class a little. I told you these, these proteins that you inherit from your parents. If you're positive for those, 99% of them will resolve their disease with no intervention in a two year period. 99%. If you don't have the allele, it's still good, and that about over half will resolve their disease and half won't. What was really interesting is Johann Grunewald looked at the people who got in steroids. He looked at this group who was CRB0103 negative and asked, what happens if you give them steroids? Well, instead of steroids helping increase the number who resolve, you actually were more likely to have to not resolve your sarcoid if you were treated with steroids. And then people who never saw steroids were more likely to resolve their disease. So it was Johann's work that really caused us to think it's our steroids and this disease our friend. And I do know that it definitely helps improve FBC, so I'm not saying to not give patients steroids, but I also think we have to realize we're probably not going to cure the disease when we do it. I mean, this is some work by Mark Jensen, where he's interested in quality of life. And so he looked at patients that were on a total of less than 500 milligrams of prednisone over the course of a year, compared to a group who got more than 500. And he just really asked kind of simple questions. Um, things like, um, so if you're African American, you were more likely to be on a higher dose of steroids than not. Um, he was unable to choose out if it was because you had more symptoms. He was also able to show that your FBC was more likely to be less. Um, if you were on a higher dose of steroids, again, we don't know if it's possible, but it's an interesting association. 
And then he asked, he had him complete a questionnaire. And what he was able to show is that if you look at the fatigue, so this is the stuff that says activity index, and it basically looked at the prevalence of fatigue. And so the more steroids you were on, the more likely you were to complain of fatigue, and the less satisfied you were with your quality of life. So you were able to do your activities of daily living, like laundry, wash your car, play football with your kids. Uh, the more steroids you were on, the less likely you were to be able to do that. So the things, just looking at this, you can learn a lot from clinical data, and it helps us understand as scientists what the best questions to ask. So we understand why people started off using steroids. Ron Crystal showed in a very elegant study that sarcoid sex, the immune cells of sarcoid patients are more active than those from graduate students. He also shows that if you present an acute form of sarcoid that's more likely to resolve, it's less likely to happen if you get immune suppressant. We also show that the higher, the more prednisone you give patients, the more they're going to have symptoms and a decreased quality of life. So then um, I went back to this because in TB we know the same thing is true, that your immune system is your friend. So what distinguishes someone from being TPD positive versus having active disease is the strength of their immune system. You know, that's why HIV is such a bell, a bulwark for people getting TB people with PBD positive because as you lose PBD for positive T cell immunity, you're more likely to get active disease. So I started looking at these T cells that Ron noticed in his study. And so one of the first things he did was, so T cells are really interesting. So like at my house, we're the great. So I have twin great, twin sons who are great, Cameron and mine. And then their dad is down, Drake, and then it's Wonder Drake. So we're all Drake, but we're different Drake, right? I'm the mother, Wonder Drake, dad, John Drake, and it's Kevin Miller Drake. But it turns out CD4 T cells, there are types of CD4 positive T cells. So there's the type that Von saw, which is a TH1 cell. There's a type that you see with allergic allergy and um, parasitic infections like cystosomiasis, those are the TH2 cells. There's the TH17 cells that are present in a lot of immune diseases like lupus, Crohn's disease. T regs are also present in a lot of different um, autoimmune diseases. You've got the TH9 cells, which are pretty interleukin 9, and then you've got the follicular heifer cells, which are also present in autoimmune diseases. And they seem to be a gateway between T cells and B cells. So different types of T for positive T cells. But well, we looked at the TH17 cells. The reason we looked at it is, this is a review that happened since then, but there was really some very interesting work that they were really high in patients with sarcoidosis. And so we asked, could they be positive in pathogenesis? <clears throat> so when you look at a granuloma, if you stain it, the overwhelming majority of the T cells in sarcoid granuloma are T17 cells. And it turns out that they actually have a personality disorder, so they're not just T17 cells. They're what we call T17.1 cells, so they keep secrete these two proteins, IL-17A and interferon B. And the higher the percentage of these cells in the granuloma, the more likely the patient is to develop fibrosis. So we're trying to figure out how do these cells cause fibrosis. And so Laura Koss uh, published earlier this year something that we kind of already know. She looked at sarcoid patients. These are um, Sweden, Swedish and American, Scandinavian and American patients. She so resolved with patients who had sarcoidosis and they were getting over their disease. Non progressive were those who had abnormal chest x rays but didn't require treatment. And then progressive were those who had abnormal chest x rays but required treatment. And she basically looked at these populations the CH17 population I told you about, the T17.1 population, the TH1, which is the pre interferon gamma. And what she showed, which I think is super interesting, is when you brought patients to make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, if they have a high number of T17.1 cells in their um, BAL, they're more likely when you follow them three years down the road to have progressive disease. And if they have a low number of those cells present, they're more likely to resolve their disease. And so this work suggests that there's a potential biomarker. And so I'm going to talk to you about why this might be. So before I do that, I just want to talk to you about two clinical trials that we did, which is super interesting. So the cool thing about being a scientist is that you can tell people don't know what causes stuff. You can do about near anything because nobody can criticize it, right? I mean, nobody knows where to go. So one of the things we did, because sarcoid has so much overlap with TB, one of the first things we did was just did molecular analysis of TB, of sarcoid tissue and asked, is any mycobacterial DNA present? 
And we found DNA, not a live organism, but DNA in about 80 percent of them. 80 percent of the people were either given skin, their lungs, their skin, their cracks, or brain and lungs that had microbacterial DNA. So then in TB, you may not realize it, but we only grow out bacteria in about 60 percent of the cases. And so in order to do sensitivity, you can actually look for the genes that the antibiotics work against. So, for example, if you want to get cipro, you can look at the DNA genetics gene. If you want to get risk for fasting, you can look at the RLP gene. So you can actually look at the gene in the tissue and figure out what you get to. So I came up with this um, regimen that we call the clear regimen. So we give concomitant, leviquin, a sandwich called um, azithromycin and risperidone. So it's called the clear regimen. And we start off with people with sarcoid of the skin and just ask if we give them these antibiotics, will they get better? And the reason we do skin is number one, while it's not, you don't look great, you're not going to die from cutaneous sarcoidosis. So if I was wrong, you know, no big deal. And then the other thing is, if I was wrong, you know, if something bad happened, it's just skin, you know. And so it's not, you know, skin can regenerate itself. So we start off with 30 people. We randomized 15 to either the clear regimen, so the four antibiotics, or placebo, four different placebo targets. And we had four withdrawals from each arm. And the thing that's so funny to me is even though they, these people were on four drugs and these people were on, I think we gave them like cellulose or something, whatever the pharmacy tried to give them. There was one person that each had diarrhea, one person each food with joint pain, uh, one had insomnia, which is the world that's outside of the with one alone, and then one had incorrect diagnosis, and then two were lost to follow so we wanted to have 11 people in each group from three to eight weeks later. And so it's super interesting because, um, I'm sorry, this would be over here. Um, so what we saw is that there wasn't a big change from baseline to eight weeks in people that took placebo, but nine of the 11 suffered. And I wish I had taken a video of it. It was like TV. So people are really motivated when their disease impacts their ability to make a living. So for example, one of the people in the study was this physician who couldn't operate because when he would get in the an orthopedist after a really long surgery, his lesions would start to sweat and it would itch so bad he would have to take his gloves off in the middle of his surgery, kind of grind stuff off and then come back in. So he flew in to Nashville, Tennessee from Florida, in Florida and to do this study. So he was really motivated. But he was one of those people who completely resolved his disease. Another was an engineer who I'll show you his lesions. So it was pretty amazing. So this was an engineer who had a really high impact job, but he couldn't wear pants because his sarcoid was so, he had the ultimate form of sarcoid. He couldn't wear pants because there wasn't, uh, the width of the pants leg for him was, wasn't sufficient. I and mean, this is him after his eight weeks of the clear record. And then when we did biopsy, so we did biopsy at baseline at, at four weeks and at eight weeks, and you can see that the granuloma actually resolved completely after the eight weeks of therapy. And what's super interesting is we looked at what was happening to the immune system. Because remember, I'm telling you that if you have a strong immune system, you're more likely to resolve your disease. And so what we were able to show is that when we looked at people with placebo, we took placebo, both um, interleukin 2 and interferon gamma was really low, remained really low, basically unchanged if they weren't placebo. But if they took the antibiotic regimen, there was an almost significant increase in IL2 and a significant increase in interferon gamma. And then this is just a measure of how well the T cells work. And we basically just show that their T cells start working like a healthy person after they had, for the people who got better, their T cells work just like a healthy person. And then an unexpected effect um, was that one of the people with skin sarcoid also had a mass in his eye. He actually had a proptotic eye. And about four weeks into it, he said, Dr. Greg, I feel like my eye is going back into his pocket. You know, I mean, people tell you anything. But, you know, he's just nodding. Oh, that's great. And so, um, but then, a few weeks later, his ophthalmologist called me and he said, what did you do? And I said, he signed consent. I don't know what the problem is, but he signed consent. You know, and so he said, no, no, I'm not upset. I'm not upset. I said, okay, yeah, he did sign consent. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I, I, I was the one, so this is him when he had the prosthetic eye, and this is where they did it. They actually went and did a biopsy to prove that the mass was start to go he said, so I know that that was sarcoid because we have a lot of cases in granular and the culture negative. He said, but you, um, this is his scan after he, he did that study with you. It's completely resolved. It's completely gotten better. So even though we were looking at skin sarcoidosis, we were able to see that uh, maybe it might help with patients with CNS involvement, too. It's something to think about. So then 
remember I told you that it's lung sarcoidosis that people die from. And so after I had done this, it's kind of amazing. Our director of CTSA, he's like, like, your generation doesn't have great problems with this, but I was doing And so there was like, um, you know, like, you guys don't want to read it to be, but y'all never seen anything like that, no. There's this show about this family that had two kids that were always getting in trouble, and the dad would always hear this thing out of what they would come talk to the dad, and then he was like, just like a mother would die. He would always figure out what was going on, and, you know, make you feel glad to have a dad. And so, my art director of CTSA is just like that. I mean, he is one of the smartest people I've ever met. He never tells you you're wrong. He just keeps asking you questions until you figure out that you're wrong. And so, I had gone to him about the skin talk. And he said, you know, wonder you trying to start with skin, you know, if you're wrong, it's not a big deal, nobody's going to die. And if something bad happens to skin, so I'm going to get it. Um, I was like, yeah. He said, to start with skin. So after the skin work, I went to him. I was going to skin work. So the reason I was going to him is he was, at the time, the CTSA would give you money. Like, it was like drug money. You, know? you could, just, if you had a good idea, and provide a protocol, they would give you, they would fund it. And so I said, Gordon, I want us to try the loan. And he said, well, how does it you to do that? I showed him the scan data. I said, we're getting a couple of things in uh, He said, oh, okay, well, let's do the loan. So um, this is our lung. So we started off with 25 people. Um, nine were excluded because they uh, based on the exclusion criteria. So we enrolled 15. Um, one person died. She developed some sort of viral thing, at least we think, um, some sort of viral thing. We could figure it out. Two had insomnia and leukopenia, which is a little bit side effect, and then one was lots of follow-up. So we had 11 complete four weeks of therapy, and then uh, we had another three um, drop off for the week and cited here. So we had eight complete eight weeks of therapy. So it, it is difficult. This about 60% completion of a regimen is what we see with non, when you're trying to treat non tuberculosis mycobacteria or CTB. It's really hard to take for them. It's a fact of life. But, um, and then this is just the demographic information on them, basically, they were normal. What was super cool, so in SARCOR, the way that you can tell patients are dying is how quickly the, the force vital capacity on the point of function test decline. So the more rapid decline, the more likely they are to die from their disease. So our primary endpoint was, was there a change of greater than 5% as in an individual or greater than 5% as a cohort? And so you can see that there were amazing changes. So that best was a carpenter who um, we gave the tier residency where he had almost a 30% increase in SEC. But on average, as a cohort, it was about 16%, which is way more than fair than what you see with even prednisone. And so we started seeing this improvement in their force body capacity at four weeks, and then it was definitely in place by um, eight weeks. <coughs> and then what was interesting, too, is you can see it's kind of tough. When patients are short of breath, it's a lot of reasons. Maybe they have a weak heart. Maybe there's neuro neurologic disease. Maybe there's myopathy. There's a lot of reasons why people can be short of breath. So a way to kind of assess it, to confirm it, is to do what's called a six-minute walk test. And you basically see how far they can walk in six minutes. And anything above 30 meters is considered significant. Our average increase for the cohort was uh, 87 meters, uh, so almost uh, 300 feet. And then the lower the score, the better. So the less short of breath they are after they walk is, is also supported. So they had a really low board score, which is also great. So it was super exciting. And we're doing a phase two trial, a multi center phase two trial now of pulmonary sarcoidosis with the experiment to see if it's a fluke of Vanderbilt or if it actually is true. So while we're doing the clinical trial, I went back to the bank and kind of asked, let's look at these two cells again and see if it's the strength of their immune system. Remember, I showed you that the skin people were saw with the lung people, that when we give them antibiotics, the people that got better also got a better immune system. Do you remember what showing you? Just not like you did. It's just not. So one of the things, so it's really interesting. It's, it's helpful, even if you're not interested, to go to other people's lectures because you can find things that, are, that might apply to your disease. So our cancer center is just checkpoint in the basement kingdom. And so there's all these researchers doing checkpoint in the basement. Clinicians are doing um, trials on cancer patients with checkpoint inhibitors. And um, in uh, like the premier scientific journals like science, PNAS, um, immunity, there's all this data on how these proteins on your immune cell kind of keep your immune system in balance. So like when you are taking a shower, you know it's full of bacteria, even though you're washing it itself. And you're, after you get through this shower, your PD-1 level is quite high. So by the time you dry off, get dressed, and get to your car, they've gone back down to normal. 
problem with cancer is that, so when your T cell is stimulated, it recognizes something that shouldn't be there. In addition to inducing signaling, it induces upregulation of this protein called PD1. And the reason, and it's actually nine others, but PD1 is the one we focus on. The reason this is helpful is it, it keeps your immune system from killing you. So what it feels like, somebody coughs in your face, well, you know, your PD1 is high. Well, the last thing you want is to go into sepsis. You know, you're doing an HMP, somebody coughs on you, you're in sepsis, can't finish your HMP, it goes PD1 and go up. You know? But you, the PD1 goes up, it tells the immune system, yes, indeed, this is foreign, let's try to clear it, but let's not kill them trying to clear it. Does that make sense? So sepsis is basically your immune system saying, I'm going to kill the host in order to get rid of it. You know? And PD1 is telling the immune system, I'm asking you not to do that. So, one of the first things we did is we looked at biopsies from diagnostic biopsies from patients with sarcoidosis and just asked, is there any expression of PDL1, which is um, the ligand for PD1 that's on antigen presenting cells, or is there any expression for PD1? And so, these, um, these are not graduate students. These are people who died like on the scrub that had healthy lungs. This is our healthy control room. And then we looked at sarcoidosis, and you can see there's really high expression of PDL1. And then on the T cell, Better T cells that are not inside the granuloma, you see um, PD1 expression. So then we went and drew blood. So these healthy controls, it's hilarious. So graduate students think $25 is a lot of money. And so we said, we'll give you $25 to let us draw your blood. And so these are, these are our healthy controls. And then these are our patients with sarcoidosis. And then they're really motivated because they want us to find something that will help them get better. So when you draw the blood, you can see that there's a huge difference between sarcoidosis subjects and healthy controls and PD-1 expression on their T cells. And then if you look at the peripheral blood of sarcoid subjects compared to the T cells in the lungs, it's even higher. And that's what this illustrates. That if you look, this is as a cohort and these are specific individuals who really get to be on C and DNA. And what was super interesting is that, remember there's different types of CD4 T cells, and those TX17 cells are the ones with the highest PD-1 expression. And so, if you look at sarcoid subjects when you diagnose the disease, PD-1 is definitely high. If you follow patients and look at those who resolve, their PD-1 levels go back down. So, it's not quite as normal for healthy control, but it's close to it. And if people get worse, either their lung function is getting worse or developing sarcoid outside the lung, their PD-1 expression is going up. So, one of the things we were able to see is that if you're progressing with the number of cells you have that express PD-1 continues to climb, and if you're getting better, the percentage of cells goes down. And that's, this is with that patient that we follow longitudinally. So then what I did was, so even when you're doing people stuff, you need a positive control. And the end stage for sarcoid subjects with, who are losing lung function is fibrosis. So then I went and asked one of my collaborators, uh, Lisa Lancaster and Jim Lloyd at Vanderbilt, could we have blood from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? because they develop a lot of fibrosis. And for them, 6% of them are going to be dead in three to five years. So the question I had was, could we figure this out? So we first of all, we just took them, um, you know, you diagnose ICI by uh, getting extra tissue, not the ALS that we do with charcoal cells. So we took some of the diagnostic biopsies, and it turns out they stay in also for PDL1 and PD1. And it's a significant difference. And then this is healthy control lungs for people who got a symptom of a lung disease. And then we asked, are the, the T cells in IPS subjects, is it high? Because if my hypothesis is right, that if PD-1 is driving fibrosis, then IPS subjects should have high PD-1 positive T cells too. And it turns out they did. And if they didn't, they wouldn't have done But they, they did. They had high compared to the healthy control. This is a different set of graduates do. And just like them, uh, like the sarcoid subjects, it was the TH17 cells that expressed the most PD-1. And then their immune cells don't work normal either. Just like in the sarcoid subjects who are getting worse. Their immune cells don't work normal either. And so then we asked, so how could PD1 be doing this? The really cool thing, so um, in cancer, a lot of what I'm learning is based on what the writers are reporting in the cancer literature. So what we saw that was so super cool is John Murray published in Science that when PD1, so remember that checkpoint inhibition works in about 20% of people. And so the NIH has given them a ton of money to figure out why it doesn't work in the other 80%. And so they're publishing all these super high-impact papers to help us figure out why it doesn't work. And basically what they show is that if the cancer is expressing TGS beta, then checkpoint inhibition does not work. And so I was like, so if we're just a um, T 
CGM theta, so that's pro fibrotic. And they actually show that there's some fibrosis in cancer. I mean, I feel like I just want to pull everybody on the knees every day. That's tough. You know? So it turns out that the cancers that produce CGF beta actually have fibrosis in them. And so John published in science like before I had this idea that um, CGF beta was an independent effect for resistance to check my inhibition. So then I said, well, maybe our cells are producing CGF beta. So one of the first things we did is we took our healthy controls, our stock force, and our IKEA, and we just asked, is there any evidence of uh, there's two forms of TGF beta? And it turns out that in both forms, it's much higher and the stock force patients seem worse in the IKEA studies compared to healthy control. And this is basically the concentration, and it shows that the concentration is highest in people with flank cycles. And then this is just a high chart to show we can do math. But so when you look at sarcoidosis and IKEA, it's basically the TH17 cells are the ones that are expressed in the TGF cells. So, um, so the cells that were the highest in the sarcoidosis subject and in the IPS subject are also the cells that are producing this TGF cell. It has never been described before. Isn't that and so, um, so then we, so then, so we know that it has analogic importance. It's secreting a set of uh, protein that may induce fibrosis. So then the next question you have to ask is, you know, well, does that really mean anything? So if you, so the only way to do that is to take cells that can induce fibrosis, we call them fibroblasts, and add our cells to them and see can we make them make collagen. So you can do what we call a co-culture experiment. You take cells that can produce collagen, you add the sarcoidosis T cell, and then you measure collagen before and afterwards and see if you see a difference. So what we did was um, exactly that. We did a co-culture experiment with sarcoidosis um, cells. This is, so to get in a high impact you all, you have to show the same thing two different ways. And so this is basically just showing that, yes, indeed, when you look at the fibroblast by themselves, there's a little bit of collagen production. You have healthy control. There's basically, so these are the grad student cells that have low PD-1, you don't see a difference. But if you have sarcoidosis subjects with high PD-1, it can't just be sarcoid T cells then you'll be an increase in collagen production. And then the same thing with IPF. It was even more dramatic. When we use the two cells in patients with IPF, you got even more collagen production. Either way, they should get it, whether it's low pack, cytometry, or a life. So definitely, if you add the cells to the fibroblast, they will induce collagen production. So then we ask this. I don't show you this at the time, but basically, if you use, remember, software subjects who are getting better, their PD-1 is low. If you add those cells to fibroblasts, it does not induce collagen production. So it wasn't something about software studies. I was trying to prove it was PD1. <coughs> so one of the things we did is we said, well, what happens if we block PD1? If PD1 really is the factor, can we treat the cells before we add them to the fibroblast, block PD1, and does it make a change in collagen production? It totally does. So if we add, this is fibroblast by themselves, this is a baseline, this is collagen going up. And this is what happens when you block PD-1 first. And then this is just going in two or three different ways. And the same thing with the IPS cells, is you just get a uh, drop in collagen production if you block PD-1 first. And then uh, the high-impact paper, they want you to show stuff in two different ways. So this is using Western blood analysis and showing you see the same thing. If you add T cells to fibroblasts, you get a lot of collagen. You block it, it goes down. This is um, anti-smooth muscle action, which actually goes up because of the time points that we looked at. And then this is fibronectin, which shows that it goes down and down. So then we're going to go reverse it. So remember I told you that um, PD-1 is increasing TGF beta and IL-17A expression. And then if you block it, you get reduced collagen. So this is just showing that the reduction in collagen is because we are indeed in IPF and sarcoid subjects, reducing the IL-17A. And that uh, this reduction is associated with, so let's show you the <laughs> so there's a um, so again I went to the oncology literature and they show that PDL1 actually regulates this transcription factor called STAT3 and STAT3 actually drives these proteins that are pressed our body, IL 17A and CTFA. It actually drives it. So when you block PD1, the STAT3 levels go back down. This is mRNA and then this is slow type cytometry. I mean, this is slow type mRNA for this. this is and then we use chemical inhibition of STAT3 and just showed if you use a chemical called static and block STAT3, it also reduces collagen production in people. And then we did the mouse stuff. So, you know, I grew up really poor. I mean, like, super poor. 
And uh, if, there, if there's a way to be super poor, I grew up there. And so I was determined not to work with money. I felt like I was given to society. You know, you're supposed to be exposed to that at some point in your life. I was exposed early on. So I was determined as a scientist not to work with mice, rats, anything that doesn't pay rent that showed up in your house, I was not going to work with. But I was told that the only way I'm going to get this into a high impact journal is I have to show it in mice. And I understand better now uh, why it is. For, so you have to realize that those high impact work is all PhD that are doing it. It's not permission for the most part. And they want to, to take something that's alive, show your therapy work, and then and that you prevent it from dying. That's basically what they want to do. And the only way to do it is to, to learn. So hopefully God is not partial to mine. So anyway, um, what, what you can do, so there's a chemotherapy agent, which we all know, which we use called bleomycin. Complication of bleomycin is pulmonary fibrosis. A lot of studies, the study pulmonary fibrosis involves giving mice bleomycin. So one of the first things we did was we gave them bleomycin and asked, are the PD-1 positive people positive cell count? And uh, so I was working with an animal guy at Yonago, and he was like, it's not going to be high. I said, I'm totally He was like, how do you know? I said, I'm a girl. I know. And so, but we were able to prove it conclusively, whether you stimulate the T cells or not, whether you stimulate them or not, that PD-1 expression goes high. And it's associated with the T cells not working well, just like we saw in the sarcoid and the IPS study. So then what we did was, so you can start off with what they call a proof of concept study. You knock the gene out of the mouse. Like I thought PD-1 was driving all of this. So what I did was ordered mice that are just like wild type mice, except they don't have the PD-1 gene. And then we gave them bleomycin. So if I'm right, then they should get less fiber. And so that's what we saw. So this is the lungs of a mouse who got bleomycin and all the kind of navy blue purplish is collagen, which we measured in the people. That's collagen in their lungs at 4x and at 10x. And then this is what the lung looks like if you don't have PD-1 and get glial exposure. It's not normal, but you have very limited amounts of collagen. So it's a huge drop in collagen if you didn't have the gene for PD-1. Now, the problem with that is you cannot knock the gene for PD-1 out of people. You can't do it. I mean, like, it's not compatible with life. Isn't that interesting? I mean, like, you could go in utero and knock the PD-1 gene out, but you would not do it. So, so the next thing is, can we give anti-PD-1 therapy in the day? So what we did was we gave the mice Blio again, and uh, we did it before and after Blio. This is the after Blio, and uh, four days after Blio, when the two cells are headed to the lung. And what you see is, again, a significant drop. So you see almost no collagen, which is that light blue, that the kind of medium blue that we're looking for, kind of an Indian color. So you see, and my, we gave them an attack antibody, like IgG didn't work against anything. And then we gave them an antibody against PDL1, the ligand for PD1. And so we saw a significant drop. And what was super cool, so just like IPS patients, as they're getting close to the death, they start losing a lot of weight. The mice that didn't get anti pdl one would start losing weight, and the next day they would be dead if we didn't sacrifice them beforehand. Well, when you give acetate antibody, they lose a lot of weight much faster. This is just basically our control antibody. They lose weight a lot faster than the mice that got uh, PD-1 blockade. And then that, that difference in weight loss correlated with a significant reduction in collagen content. And then we were able to show that when we give anti-PDL1, we have a reduction in the um, PD-1 positive, PD-4 positive T cells, and that that reduction is associated with a reduction in phosphostatin, the transcription practices driving the prophylactic cycle. So, you guys have listened well. So we've learned a couple of things. One of the things we've learned is that it's, you know it's okay to not know what causes the disease. The reason I don't like it when people say idiopathic. You're kind of giving yourself permission to not learn something. You know, like when you say it's idiopathic. Well, a lot of stuff is idiopathic, but we figure it out, you know? And so I think when even a disease like sarcoid, when you look at other diseases, read other people's literature, it can give you an idea of what might be a good thing to at least try. And the good thing about idiopathic diseases is your idea is good as everybody else's because nobody knows, you know? And then the other thing is definitely focusing on the TH17 pathway. So the really cool thing about, let me go back to this. This is probably what's so amazing about 
the T is 17 cells, so there's antibody against T1, there's antibody against T L1. That's FDA approved for use in humans. Humans. We have second clinical map, which is antibody against IL 17A. That's also FDA approved. And then we also have drugs against that three, like metformin, everyday old metformin that's now an old oral hypoglycemic. It's also a stat three inhibitor. So this work by itself has identified three potential, so they're all FDA approved, but three potential therapeutics for patients with lung fibrosis through this epidemic. So it's so exciting that we get all these new options we can try in future. So um, right now, so yesterday, the reason I was here late yesterday is because I was meeting with the head, part of, the head of Heart Lung Blood Institute for us to discuss uh, designing clinical trials to use this regimen for people with progressive lung disease. And then uh, there's no way, so I sit in my office and type all this, I can read, and, but there's just a team of people. So the paper has 30 people on it. Uh, but this is the core. So all the animal stuff was done by Dr. Um, Wilson Luau. Um, a lot of the um, ideas with Zinzi and I like going back and forth. I keep becoming like a teenager and questioning every idea I have. Um, so we got my postdoctoral fellow. So Zinzi has a K now on um, faculty at Vanderbilt. Um, Wilson is a research assistant professor. Uh, Ozio Machioma is a large grant from the Foundation for Circuit District Research. And then King Abel is uh, helping us with the animal work too. So I'm very grateful to them because I sit in things and they're the ones that are actually doing this. I'm not actually working with the mice, which is why we have not studied uh, Kenny and his own a lot. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, it has not been looked at, to my knowledge. Um, I know that um, I was just at Washington University a couple of weeks ago with um, David. He's a big neurosarcoid guy. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is to look at the immune system in the CMS. I know when they look at the experimental model for um, multiple sclerosis, C17 cells are definitely important. And so I think it's true, if the same pathway is true, but I, I don't want to lie and tell you. I'll say yes, uh -huh. it probably will. <laughs> That's an excellent question. I think people are just, John Wary's work that just came out in science earlier this year, I think it's the first to help people understand that checkpoint inhibitors may be felt like that. Um, I don't think people thought about it before now. I think the animal work suggests that TV1 is more than just an association. If it was just an association when you knock out the gene, there shouldn't be any change in fibrosis, and when you block it, you shouldn't see a reduction in fibrosis. So I, I don't think it's possible. I was at a team and yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't. So what I think is happening is PD1 is driving TA17 cell development with effect on stress. So I think PD1 gets upregulated in all of us, but when it stays upregulated, it alters your transcriptome, leads to increase. Stat 3 expression, and then Stat 3 is what drives more gamma C, which causes TA17 development. So I didn't put it in here because this is more of a clinical audience, but I think PD1 is the head and our 17 a is the product.
get. Yeah, so, so we totally, so we have published, so you're right, that two breaks are elevated in patients with sarcoidosis. We published in J.I. probably five years ago and showed that the two breaks are dysfunctional and that you can restore it by giving them IL-2. What I think is really happening, you know, there's all this data about CD4 T-cell plasticity, how TH1 can become T-Rex, T-Rex can become T-17. When we look at the inflammatory milieu, there's a lot of IL-6, IL-23, so it's thriving T-17 development and TGF beta. Remember, if you have high TGF beta, you become a T-17 cell, low TGF beta, you become a T-Rex. And so what I think is happening, definitely CD1 upregulation is present in the T-Rex population. Um, it's in an IPF and sarcoid deficit. And we definitely show that the T-Rex don't have normal suppressive capacity unless you give them IL-2. You know what, and I don't think you're wrong. Um, I think we just, I just submitted a grant uh, today to look better at this. So this is in the I'm amazing. <laughs> now, there are people actually, there, there are people who submit grants for us at Vanderbilt. So um, if you look at the DRB 1301, the ones that are likely to resolve, I'm not Definitely the lost strength patients, the ones who are more likely to resolve. When you look at the, yeah, this is what I'm to show you. I didn't discuss it, but if you look at the T ray, so they have a higher percentage of T ray than those who are chronic. And when you look at the cytokine expression of their CD4 T cells, it's more of a balance. So you've got interferon gamma, IL 17A, IL 2, IL 22, and some IL 10 which is not present in the people who are crying, where you see more low, low interfering gamma and high IL-17. So I think that the, the immunophenotype you know, you know, is more diverse in people who are resolving their disease. You've got more t regs functional t regs you've got more functional CH17 cells, you've got more functional um, CH1 cells. Yeah. No, I'd love to talk to you. Oh, I'd love to. Um, a good question. So it's kind of so. I guess they don't have so many symptoms they do. Yeah, I did, I did primary care for two years, but right after residency, I was under this delusion I could get out of debt if I worked hard enough. Um, but um, one of the things that we learned is, you know, the most common reason for chronic cough is actually for cuttings, or subclinical for cuttings and such. And, and so we, we saw a lot of people with chronic cough who actually had for cuttings. You know, they had been vaccinated and immunity at one end, so I think they're pushing new guidelines to give them the um, for me, I think that sarcoid, when people have symptoms that don't resolve and you get an x ray that's got higher agnosophy, then that's when I think of sarcoid. DNA. Mm -hmm. This is an NCM infection. It's not an NCM infection. So um, I think now that we're doing microbiome analysis, I think we're realizing that we're not as good at diagnosing infections as we thought. And I think when you have a pathogenic bug, it's definitely reasonable to expect that when you suppress the immune system, people get a, a resurgence of their disease. So that makes sense. What if you're infected with something, a wannabe pathogen? 
that takes you two decades, or it takes two decades to kill a human being. Something that wants to be a pathogen. You know? And so I think there's a lot of really convincing data, like um, Jerome Rich showed that when you suppress patients with sarcoid, they're more likely not only to have a faster decline in the SBC, but for sarcoid to appear outside the lung, with the changes, the CNS manifestations. Why could publish this data showing how that still works? I mean, I think, at least for me, you know, people, I would call that getting worse. Like if you gave, like for example, if you're in Africa and you don't have vaccine, and you want to, somebody comes in with a cute pneumonitis from TPP, the first thing you do is give them steroids. It'll hold them until you can get back from there. It does not mean that they don't have an infection. It means that it's a TH1 mediated disease. I haven't studied because I'm not an oncologist, but I would be really interested to study it. You know, there's a paper that should be EPUB like in the next month that someone sent me, basically showing so two things. I'm not sure it's sarcoid, like all not, not all non patient granulomas are sarcoid, because this resolves in two months as opposed to two to five years of sarcoid. The other thing that's really interesting is that when you look at their immunophenotype, it's a lot of TH1 cells, and so that also kind of goes against it being a typical sarcoid. It, and, it, and honestly, maybe sarcoid. I mean, it's a diagnosis with exclusion, so it's a little bit tough. But I think it would be interesting if we to get some biopsies and see if there's mycobacterial nucleic acid in it. Now, that would make me feel bad. I mean, I think when you um, look at the anti pdl one therapy, Misha, at University of Misha Rothenberg, at the dermatologist, I have a paper that's going to come out showing that when you use PD, anti pdl one therapy, the incidence is like one, one thirtieth of what it is with PD-1. So it's a little bit tough to know exactly what's happening with PD-1. When you give anti PD-1 therapy, they develop these, what we call SLR, sarcoid like that. Dr. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you.